learning how to run in a mobile world, BYOD, MDM, and end user behaviors. Our moderator is Lewis Carr. He is the Senior Director of Worldwide Software Industry Market Development for HP Software, where he is charged with building a team of vertical industry experts, including government. Lewis has been in various engineering and product management and research and analysis positions surrounding government IT over the last 28 years. During the previous 10 years, he has been a global government industry market researcher with Sun Microsystems, BEA Software, and most recently, Oracle. So uh, join me in welcoming Lewis. Well, thank you very much. I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to moderate uh, such an esteemed panel. Um, I'm going to let them introduce themselves so that uh, they don't have to worry about me making any mistakes <laughs> in misrepresenting their background. But before I do that, I at least want to um, provide you with some rationale behind how we put together this panel. It's not simply we picked volunteers, but we also wanted to look to make sure we represented accurately um, sort of a, a cross range of what you might see today in the federal government in terms of some of the thought leadership around mobility. So we've got everything from someone who, in the form of uh, Sonny, who uh, is the CIO for State of Hawaii, so we have state representation, although Sonny has extensive background in the federal government. Um, we have um, uh, uh, Commander Keyes, um, who is Captain Keyes, who is also uh, with the Coast Guard, and uh, you know, with the Coast Guard, you, you, you've obviously had mobile involved in what they do day to day for a very long time. So, you know, a real history or track record in, in mobility. Um, we also have uh, 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 Teresa uh, um, Gravenstein, who I'm still gonna, I always worry about messing up people's names, and of course that's what I do. Um, but T Teresa, with the U.S. House of Representatives, it's sort of an organization where you, you would see how, you know, social media collaboration, the consumerization of IT would have, extreme pressure points on what you're doing in terms of, of your, your viewpoint and uh, the desire to go into mobile. So again, the, the, the topic today is learning how to run in a, a world that is increasingly becoming mobile, uh, dealing with bring your own device, but for that matter, it doesn't matter if it's bring your own device or government furnished equipment, uh, you are still uh, have to be uh, considerations around the mobile device management, you'd still have the considerations around security, the full application lifecycle management, of course the data management, uh, and so quite frankly, regardless of whether you're looking at BYOD or not, you're going to find this panel of interest. The last thing is that mobility brings a new um, reset button, if you will, that has to be pushed around in user behaviors, right? Because what you do and how you do it on a mobile device is very different. Um, as uh, Jessica said, and I want to thank Jessica before I forget, because she put this panel together and supported us in, in collecting together material and having us uh, really start communicating with each other. But, you know, when you start talking about the end user behavior with mobile devices, everything changes. The, the, the patience level, what you can get out to the device. From a security perspective, if you think you're concerned about security, uh, cyber security now, imagine when you have all these additional attack surfaces and vulnerability points that are going to get exposed when you go to mobile devices. And in that sense, BYD simply, BYOD simply becomes a red herring. You're still going to face those even if you were to do GFE. So uh, enough with that as background. What we're going to do is have each of the speakers uh, the panelists describe a bit about their background, uh, again, so I don't further butcher it like turn the captain into a commander, um, and we're also going to um, have them describe what they're doing in their particular organization. We'll give about seven minutes each to do that, and then after that, we're going to open it up for questions. Um, given the small room, um, you might think that you can easily uh, talk and everyone will hear you, but it that may not be the case, so there will be somebody roving around with a microphone. Um, so in order to avoid having to repeat your question, try to raise your hand and have the person come over with the microphone. Um, I may still end up repeating your question. Uh, you know, 
prepositioning your question with a short statement is perfectly fine if it ends with a question. <laughs> um, that would be great. Um, I, I've already told the panelists I may um, reserve the right to ask them follow-up questions. We may actually hopefully with your questions avoid having to use the questions they've all been uh, kind enough to, to, to develop um, in advance. So with, with all of that as the backgrounds on logistics, I'm going to start uh, with Teresa. Uh, so, and I'm going to sit down too. <laughs> Hello? Oh, there we go. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, all, everybody, for being here. Thank you, G. Terry, for inviting me as well. Uh, my name is Teresa Grafenstein. I'm the Inspector General of the U.S. House of Representatives. Uh, just to kind of give you a quick overview of what that means, a lot of times people hear IG, and there's certain connotations that come to mind. It's sort of, uh, you know, maybe after the fact, rock thrower, um, you know, coming in after after the battle. And I had one general told me earlier in my career that auditors are the one come in after the battle and bang at the wounded. Um, but honestly, the way that we handle our, my IG responsibilities with U.S. House Representatives is very proactive. I see myself as a chief risk advisor. Um, my position, unlike any other position in Congress, is one that is, uh, requires a bipartisan, unanimous consent. So I'm appointed by the Speaker, Minority Leader, and Majority Leader acting jointly. And so if you understand how very partisan it can be up there, it, that's literally just shy of an act of God to get them to agree on things. And so I take my role very seriously, but I do see myself as a nonpartisan risk advisor. And so I'm working in an environment um, where it's, it's like the wild, wild west in the sense that you have 435 CEOs essentially and um, Congress has by, by and large opted out of um, either explicitly or implicitly in, in laws. Most laws do not apply to them. And so I'm working in an environment, and, and as much as that sounds, wow, that's great. No, it's not. <laughs> it makes my job very difficult because I, I, I can't just say, well, the law says this or the rule says that because um, for the most part, they're exempt. Um, with the exceptions of things like federal election laws and those types of things. So with that, I have to get very sort of uh, creative in defining risk. And so as, um, just like all of your organizations, the need for mobility and wanting to have their own personal devices has been, is prevalent. And so we've been doing BYOD before we called it BYOD. We've been, apparently we're a trendsetter. We've been doing this for forever because from an election law perspective, you can't have you can't use government furnished equipment to receive or communicate election or um, types of, you know, campaign types of activities. It's an actual violation of the law. And so they're always walking around with multiple devices to make sure that they don't make mistakes. And so with that, my environment's kind of interesting where I have to point out risks to them that say, um, if you are forwarding your house email to your election campaign device, what does that do? There's uh, most folks in the executive branch wouldn't realize that Congress is not subject to FOIA, which everybody else is subject to FOIA. We're not subject to FOIA. It's an uh, article of the Constitution. There's a speech and debate clause that kind of gives that shield. So questions with mobility come into play. Okay, so if you forward this to your personally owned device, does the art article of the Constitution, does that protect that information now that it's on your personal device and no longer on house equipment? So it's these types of um, questions that I pose. If we're doing an investigation, because I have full investigative authorities as well in the Congress, um, if I'm doing an investigation and it's their personally owned device and um, is that considered, and uh, we have to look at sort of the investigative procedures, can we grab that device pull the information off it. You have to be very, very clear when you go into this environment to fully disclose and understand up front who owns the data, what roles and responsibilities everybody has. Can I remotely zap your data and what legal consequences does the house face? Those types of things. So I'm going to pass it over. Uh, Kevin? Or, I mean, yeah. sir, Kevin. Okay. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for uh, allowing me to be with you today. I'm Commander Kevin Keese with the U.S. Coast Guard, and I'm stationed at the Telecommunications Information Systems Command in Alexandria, Virginia. Um, my job title, I'm the Enterprise Information Systems Infrastructure, or EASY, and that's kind of a play on words. I didn't pick it. But um, I've, I've been in the Coast Guard 22 years. I have a mixed career of uh, half operational, half of, of doing C4, ISR, and IT. 
and I'm happy to be here today and tell you a little bit about what the Coast Guard's been doing with uh, mobility. Uh, in particular, we've been doing mobility solutions for approximately eight years. Uh, we were, uh, were very uh, um, adamant about having that capability because of our unique 11 Coast Guard missions. We're everywhere and we need to be everywhere and have connectivity wherever we are, depending on whether or not we're responding to a uh, Hurricane Sandy or if we're working a Deepwater Horizon incident. One of the things the Coast Guard has right now is our, our current state has, has been interesting because uh, we started out with our mobility solutions using Windows uh, uh, six phones. Back in the day, we used the good dynamics or good for enterprise solutions. And today, we're doing the same thing. Whereas uh, DoD has gone primarily in the in the area of BlackBerry, we've gone with the good uh, good design simply because of where we came from. So we built that architecture, and that was way back in the day before we started any type of service management or anything. And today, we're trying to get a handle on that because one thing that's unique about the Coast Guard is we do report through the Department of Homeland Security but our networks are all on the dot mil side, which makes it very, very challenging being a public service oriented organization where we have a tremendous responsibility to the Department of Dep Defense, including falling under the Navy in time of war. So we have to deal in, in a multiple playing fields, being able to work with state, local, federal agencies, tribal ag agencies as well, uh, to share information as well as being able to maintain our DOD presence and all the security controls that go along with that. Currently today, we're, we're, we have a, an organization where we have about 8,500 uh, devices out there. We, we made the step moving from Windows 6 to uh, the iOS, Apple, and also Android platforms. And the reason for that was because you may have uh, remembered back when Windows Phone first came out, it wasn't quite ready, and we, we had to make a move. The Windows 6 phones did not, they, they were failing, and they were a, a huge security risk. So we had to make a, a move, and at that time, what we did is we shifted over to the Android and the Apple phones, which are service tre like tremendously. What we provide now is we provide a, a mobile email service that has a calendaring and task management, a lot of the things you would find in, in an Outlook client on the mobile devices. And our users are using that right now, and it is in a secure environment, which has been the, the huge challenge for us. So we, we're moving forward with all these devices in the, in, the, in the email environment, passing all kinds of information, PII, law enforcement sensitive, all kinds of operational information and how we keep that secure has been an extreme challenge. And how we not only keep the email piece of it, but where we go from here. Where we're going to go is we're looking at trying to provide some sort of an application store or an environment in, in which we can provide various applications to the users. But we see that these phones have taken over our lives. They're a dual persona device. How do we get users to sign up for things and say, you know, we're good right now. Currently, to get a, a device in the Coast Guard, you have to be of a certain, uh, have a certain need for it, and people will sign up and sign a user agreement saying that they'll use their phone for business and, and limited personal use. Well, does that mean you can allow Angry Birds on the device or not? Can you allow the flashlight application that has a built-in Easter egg on it, so where you click a certain few different colors, it becomes a, an internet access point? Uh, that's real stories. Those types of things are real issues that we need to deal with. And we've been involved with a lot of boards and mobility uh, working groups for a long time, including the DOD one, but also with DHS and other agencies. So we see that as a huge challenge, and I'm looking forward to discussing things today and, and talking a little about, about where we're going, how we've been, made it, uh, been able to make it successful in the Coast Guard, and how we've been able to uh, make the, basically the service model and see how important IT service management for providing a service like this is. Mahalo, uh, Keith. Uh, I'm sorry, Kevin. <laughs> uh, I wanted to uh, first say aloha to everyone, and is glad, I'm glad to be back in the DC area. I see a few familiar faces here. Uh, uh, CIF for Energy, Bob, and I see Ron uh, from NIST, uh, so it's good to, to be back. Uh, I'm currently the CIO for the state of Hawaii, and the first CIO in the 50 year plus history of uh, Hawaii. Uh, I used to be a Fed, I uh, was in the FBI, I was uh, also a CIO for Interior Department and then GSA, uh, helping out with White House programs, and that's where we met a lot of our federal friends here. Uh, it's great to be back and also talking about something that is really changing the world. Today when I was driving up to Chesapeake Bay, I sort of recalled uh, a couple of years ago that I've been here, but I went to my device, my Apple iPhone 5, and I turned on Bluetooth, connected it to my car, 
uh, got the uh, uh, connections going and not only got my GPS going, but also listened to little Led Zeppelin, Pink Floyd coming in, and life was good. Beautiful day, just coasting in, and, and things were great. And so that way, I also, uh, you know, conformed to the hands-free, uh, you know, laws in Maryland. So just want to let you know that I did do that. Why is this world changing? Well, this device has changed the world. I remember back in the day where, how many of you remember Mosaic from NCS? <laughs> Oh, thank you. All right. Uh, uh, the world has changed from the, from the web world to now a web 2.0 and 3.0, where semantic web is coming out, where now you can get everything on a device that we, it's absolutely invaluable what uh, services it provides. Along with that, uh, when I was at the FBI, the director would always challenge us, says, how come I can't get what Jack Bowers got on 24? Remember that show? because he could just talk to a stealth fighter, get TSSCI information on his unclassified devices as he got real-time imagery and everything else going on. We all know it doesn't work that way, by the way. Uh, but that's the mobile vision. That is the con ops that we're all after. The world has changed so much in mobile that right now, by 2015, there's going to be 7.4 billion 802.11 devices on the market. And by 2015, mobile apps will will outperform and mobile app development will render native PC project development by four to one. What's happening now is most of these devices is growing by such a percentage that 25% of all enterprise devices will be tablets just by this next year. And data is also growing by an unstructured 800% in the next five years with structured and unstructured, out of which 800% is unstructured text. Very interesting how we can find information. This device is so powerful that it's changing our world, and obviously, we have three things to consider. One is how do we do business? We gotta do business, not only personally, but we also gotta do business in the workplace. According to a recent re uh, research, what people use at work and what people use uh, at home for mobile devices is very interesting. Number one, web, 73% on the enterprise, 78% personal. Email, 69% enterprise, 74% for personal use. And also workforce productivity and working at home, 67% enterprise, 84% personal. As you can see, this digital strategy is really taking over and making things available to you anywhere, anytime, on any device. As we look at this, we also got to consider that business is only one aspect of this. It's all about technology, the convenience of what we can get on this device. However, the format is somewhat limiting. The tablet is much more powerful, and that's why it's an interesting between my little laptop here and the other device. There's a bridge which the tablet is, is, is helping bridge. We also have cultural. And the cultural is generational. In some instances, for example, my kids think I'm not very cool in some of the things I do. Of course, I am a CIO. I don't let them know that I actually I'm pretty techy. But they have grown in a world where everything is just mobile. They don't even know any other world. Actually, oddly enough, people above 45 to 50 are the biggest social media users. They are very tech savvy, actually, oddly enough. So I don't mind my kids not knowing that I'm pretty savvy so I can watch them. It's something that is really interesting because now it is such a powerful tool that we can use. So how does mobile help us? It's all about people getting access to information through a device. So people, information, device. Informations of two kinds, open and secure. In the previous Attorney General, and, and we had a reason for this, it was protect everything, share what you must. Now it's share everything, protect what you must. Very interesting paradigm shift that's going on with the Attorney General today and the administration. I work for the governor, and our administration is very closely aligned with the White House in terms of policies that are implementing this open government uh, vision. I think there are three things that I'm very interested in in this world. One is, from the Fed standpoint, there's a mobile gov and all the work being done at GSA and the White House uh, federal CIO strategy. Please take a look at it. I believe GSA's website has that. At NASIO, we suggested an idea, and it's been adopted. If you go to nasio.org, N-A-S-C-I-O.org slash apps, there are 160 mobile apps across all 50 states that is being promulgated as a repository for use. If you go to hawaii.gov, which is the website that we have launched and we're hoping to be uh, considered for one of the best in the country, 
we have what we call the first dynamic site in the country. And what that means, it's static and dynamic. It's responsive design, mobile first, and allows us to also uh, uh, squeeze and put all the information onto a device and it works. We, we use USA Search. And so my point to you is, I don't reinvent the wheel. I want to look at all the benefits of what everyone's doing, because why use it? Why not use what's already been done to get the information that you need to get done? We have 41 apps currently in, on Hawaii.gov, and we also have 94 online services. But that's only 5% of what the government offers. Can you just imagine what's in front of us? Mobile, I believe, is the future. Let me just conclude by two, two other things. There's an opportunity and a challenge. The opportunity is information accessible anywhere, for any mission, on any device, anytime, right? And get it done, securely and reliably. That's the mission and vision, to get to that information. Easier said than done. The threats are security, privacy, and productivity. How do we balance those out? This device, in some countries, and let's just keep it at unclassified, you walk on this device to an airport, and they already compromise by the time you get off the plane over the wire. So my point to you is there are many, many ways that you can compromise that information, and that's why one has to watch it very, very carefully. So the security and convenience balance is what we need to look at. I look at BYOD as bring your own device for productivity. I don't particularly allow it right now because I got enough chaos in the universe back in IT over there that I consider BYOD to potentially be bring your own disaster to work, right? I don't want that because I got enough disasters to deal with. I just think we should look at and collectively I value the opinions that you may have and ideas that you may share. I don't purport to have it, but with all my experts at the panel and also amongst all of you, we'd love to talk about how we can improve this together. But I would just leave you this one thought. We gotta work it together because the threats are real, but the opportunities are great. Uh, mahalo. First of all, I think you can see why we have Teresa, uh, Kevin, and Sonny on this panel. Uh, and I think from what they've just said to you, you can see Teresa's actually in the process of defining the policies for a definite plan to go BYOD, uh, because her data management, her, her governance issues, it's just a different environment than, let's say, for Kevin, who I, I, I'm going to ask you a question in a minute just to, to clarify, but it does not sound to me like you're doing BYOD, um, because it would be for you bring your own disaster. So I take it then Sonny's not doing BYOD either. Um, but on the other hand, we have BYOD, we have uh, GFE, but a GFE to a very uh, a sense of where you're actually going out to very secure segmented information out to the, the end device, which is very critical, and he's also in a position where you have to deal with partners and getting sensitive information out to them. So in effect, there is a backdoor BYOD that you have to deal with. We have Sonny here who, of course, has an entire population of the state of Hawaii and all the tourists like me that like to go there from California because we go to Hawaii, we don't go to the Caribbean. Um, and so, <laughs> he likes that. Uh, so, you know, they also have their own issue with the, the backdoor trap of um, business to government and business to, or excuse me, government to, to business and government to citizen. So a lot of the issues you can see, it crosses the whole gamut of what possibly you're seeing out there. Now, um, without further ado, let's get to the question period. Again, there is someone with a microphone who's going to raise their hand so you can see they have a microphone, yes. And uh, so if you have any questions, um, please at this time raise your hand so we can get to them. Okay, you need practice raising your hands. All right. So, oh, no, we have one in the front here. So while you're coming down here to, 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 for this gentleman to ask his question, um, you know, it was very interesting, Sonny, you said that, what was that, that the, they share everything and protect what you must. Would that fit more with BYOD or GFE? These are the easy uh, Yeah. <laughs> well, that was a tough one, actually. Uh, I would say that it's actually, it, it would lend itself to BYOD, but again, you need to get all the mobile device management and get your data architecture really set. And if that works, actually, a lot of the open information should be made available to the public. It's, it, it belongs to the public. And so, therefore, I think the, the default position is open. The challenge in government is a lot of the data classification is not done properly. 
So that's why what we do is we just put uh, big old uh, security and, and other stuff around all databases, not realizing that a lot of this information has to be open and put out there. So I would say it would lend itself more to BYOD. But because of the data classification, we tend not to share information, unfortunately. Okay. And Kevin, so I, I, I understood that you initially had 8,500 devices that were Windows 6, which you mentioned had its security issues. And then you said you're, you're going to Android and iOS, which have no security issues. Everything's fine there, right? Uh, good question. Um, what we've done is, is we have all of our Windows devices are off now, and, and we have uh, uh, it's about a half and half with Android and iOS, and we actually leave that up to users, uh, depending on which device they like. But the security issues are there, and uh, this is a, a hot topic on the DoD front, because the issue right now is, what do you need to do to make a device an endpoint? And this is a little bit of a technical issue, because an endpoint meaning the device has an IP address, whereas versus something that we're implementing is we've implemented a sandbox type of strategy where there's a protected FIPS 140-2 uh, certified container on board the device in which uh, the email resides within, and you maintain your MDM uh, in both of those situations uh, is, is quite strict, and you've got to basically lock the device down, and, and we actually have two passwords required to get in the device with uh, at least eight characters, uh, upper and lower case, special characters, everything included. But it, it does impact it, but it's definitely an issue, and it's constantly changing. Um, it's not only the MDM, but it's things like the integrity of the device. So if there's another application that makes an attempt to write to a system core security file, the device is automatically wiped, things like that. So those are the, the types of technical issues. But then on the, uh, the other front that I'm sure we'll get into uh, later on are the legal issues with the uh, GFE versus uh, BYOD. So just one quick follow-up then, Kevin. So that means or implies that you have a list of applications that are sort of whitelisted and blacklisted, then I take it. Right now we do not, but we need to get there. Um, currently, we, do, we, haven't, we haven't seen a lot of, these, uh, of the applications that would, would violate any of those things, but right now we do allow our users to install applications, and basically there's the technical enforcement of the policy, and then there's the user enforcement of the policy. And you know, right now, users can actually, and, and they do, because some phones actually come installed with games and things when you buy them from the vendors. But uh, things like that are not, um, you know, where we don't go after people if they install a game or something like that uh, on their phone right now. But we are headed in that direction, especially if we move out of the area of the sandbox to move towards the using the device as an endpoint, because there are some restrictions. Within a sandbox, you don't have as many applications available, and there's certain types of notifications and push-pull of information. Uh, the robustness of the capability of the phone is somewhat limited right now within this using the sandbox technology versus going to an endpoint type capability. Okay, and to, sh okay, let me, I'll come back to you in a second. Um, my question for the panelists is this. Um, whenever there's, um, there's a saying that says, where there's chaos, there's opportunity. Uh, Teresa, Sonny, and I think it's Kevin. Uh, do you see, uh, for th those of us who are dealing with BYOD and the challenges, do you think that we're gonna have any type of relief coming, you know, like, like we have NIST standards, we have different types of standards that have evolved for most every other aspect that we have in the, the CIO ar arena, coming to like, you know, where someone will go and test these app, these uh, mobile applications at some type of level so that we can just say if it's, it's, if it's been passed through like JITIC, like in the DOD, JITIC does this testing and that type of thing, so that we're not having to spend resources over and over at different agencies, you know, um, testing iPhones or Windows phones or whatever the latest because, you know, as our leadership sees, the, sees one agency with it, you know, they come back to you the first thing is I saw someone at Department of Commerce with this iPad, so I want one. And so we have to go through the same, you know, so I'm just trying to see any types of economies of sales or at least relief for us that are in that field. Well, we have Ron Ross here in the front from NIST. We can ask him, is NIST doing anything on this? <laughs> so I would imagine that's who would probably get tagged with that. 
Um, it's kind of my environment, that it's, it, regardless of whatever the standards are, whatever's going on in the executive branch, if it's, a, if it's inherently executive branch, the Congress is like, oh, we're not going to do that. And so things like, uh, simple things like A123 for financial statements, internal controls. If I call it A123, they won't do it. If I say, we need to do a management control program, that's a great idea, Terry, and, and they'll do it. <laughs> and so I think that if we, if the executive branch does come up, and that's probably where it would live, if the executive branch does come up with standards, I think that that's a great idea to get economies of scale. Uh, we would adopt it, but I would call it something different <laughs> to try to sell it to them. So. <laughs> Yeah, I think Reggie bring up a great point. Uh, I'd say that uh, the big challenges are, according to Gartner's research, for example, and I've also corroborated this independently, is the number one challenge is data loss prevention, second one is identity management, and third one is event management. So if you just imagine what we have, our challenge is that most of these environments, because we don't have a continuous monitoring and we're not aware of what the heck's going on, really, that's what happens. So what we do is we just said, no, you can't do it, right? And so uh, that's the challenge, you know. In Hawaii, there's a saying, you know, if you can, can, if you no can, no can, yeah? <laughs> so, so I just say no can, yeah? So because, and the reason is because I have a different challenge. I've inherited, and I've inherited an environment that's up to 30 years behind. So now the hackers have refused to hack us because we are so far behind, it's beneath their dignity to hack us, you know, right now. But, but my point is, no, I'm just joking. We actually have some good stuff as well. But, Having said that, that's the challenge. But when you bring a BYOD device, there is so much uncertainty and so much, so as Teresa's mentioned, we would like to have a program where you can have a registry and check that. The biggest threat is not from the outside. We can actually manage that pretty well in the government, you know. The, le the most recent breaches, the one in South Carolina, the one in uh, Utah and other places where so many uh, SSNs were compromised, it's because of security lapses and sometimes insider problems as well. So I think you may want to take a look at that as an area, but you have a great point. I think we should strive towards to do that. I would submit to you that with the challenge and power we have in this room, I think we can solve that kind of problem. So I think we should take that up as a, as a good suggestion. Thank you. I really like the idea of a centralized information assurance or some sort of uh, baseline uh, verification capability that could be shared amongst everyone, because that would just uh, set the set the baseline or the bar at least for a minimal set of uh, IA standards that, that folks could understand it it's kind of falls along the same line of, of code signing uh, uh, folks that are signing their codes uh, with some sort of certificate actually does greatly increase the uh, the, uh, the the security involved with that and there's certainly it could doesn't have to be as complex as the code signing but it could be something that just bare bones type of uh, it's gone through some sort of test criteria, and I think that would also help businesses understand that they're not putting uh, applications on their mobile devices, because right now, it's not a secret. You're, you're probably maybe wondering why there's no antivirus software, or there is some for mobile devices. It's because it is not shown to be that effective, and that actually has come from NSA in, in a public forum. But the, until we get to some of these capabilities that are looking at that, I think something like that in a collaborative environment is required. So let me just quickly, before we go to the next question, just by a show of hands, how many of you out there are just beginning to contemplate or embark upon a mobility path for your IT platforms, unlike the folks that are on the panel? So how many of you? Just one of you. So all of you are pretty much already looking at it. That means you're already looking at the security reference architecture information that's just come out from the Federal CIO Council May 23rd, I think it was, something like that. So all of this is done deal, n no news, correct? You've all looked at that. <laughs> okay, good. If you haven't, you, it, I, I just read it like this week, so it was new for me. Um, all right, ne next question. Oh, we have a question down here in the front. Ira Grossman, Chief Enterprise Architect from FEMA. Uh, I use my own personal iPhone during Hurricane Sandy deployment because that was what was helpful to me with the citizens, showing them how to register for disaster assistance, where disaster response centers are. My BlackBerry was totally useless in those situations. In fact, for the first two weeks, we, we had very limited internet connectivity with the BlackBerry because of the massive infrastructure problems in uh, lower Manhattan and Brooklyn also. Uh, the question I have with regards to uh, bring your own device is more, um, I have Comcast in my ISP, and I have limits on what I could, uh, the size I could upload and download. And be it my own personal laptop. Uh, we use a good Citrix solution 
with Enthema. Uh, but if I were to use my own device, whether Comcast as my ISP would allow larger downloads. For instance, I've had 17, 20 gigabyte down downloads at times, and I don't, they're not gonna come through on, my, on uh, Comcast. So that's a question, I don't know if that's been addressed or even considered. Uh, not just the security issues, but again, I personally like the Citrix uh, good uh, architecture. That there's good security and, and to Commander uh, Keist, is it? Uh, you know, have you considered a application store? Because my understanding from good is you can create, you know, a, a store like the Apple Store, where you can actually only approved applications can be downloaded to your iPhone. Um, that's a great, great question and, and, cons and uh, issues. And, and in fact, the Coast Guard is adopting a um, uh, application store. And you are correct where you can actually limit what applications are available on the device, which can, in certain instances, if you don't have the processes set up correctly, uh, be, be catastrophic. When the Coast Guard and, and other folks arrive on scene, sometimes you'll, you'll find a local uh, sheriff's department might have an application that they're using for situational awareness. We need to get that on. Can we get that on quickly? And we're seeing that there are some capabilities there, and, and that, I think, in the long run, would provide more security and a little bit more configuration management and control of devices. One of the things we're, we're, uh, we're dealing with, too, and one of the things we found is best practices is that we allow Android and iOS phones, but we don't allow every model of Android phone, nor do we allow every carrier of Android phone. Why? We simply don't have the resources to be able to go out and test and verify and provide an SLA to our users, service level agreement, that this will be able to, the phone that you just purchased will be able to operate and function with the good uh, for mobile messaging that we're using right now and in the future, good dynamics, to be able to support that capability. And also, there are lemons out there. There are phones that certainly just don't meet the form factor or the battery life, and we're trying to find which ones that we want to have in the hands of our, our Coast Guard of men and women. Uh, yeah, Ira, I think good points. Uh, I, I, I think uh, I'm sort of uh, torn between, uh, unfortunately, uh, the world I came from and the world I'm in. Uh, and I, so unfortunately, I kind of see what I know are threats that are emerging all the time. And so we think uh, that's one of the challenges that we have. And the, the threat trends are now uh, not only hacktivists, these are really nation-sponsored, very, very sophisticated, lying there for a long time. So you got to take it really seriously. And so they're very, very sophisticated, and they're just focused just on, uh, on us. So I think uh, that's why uh, you know, identity management is such a big deal, and they actually want to get that and also uh, payment and all those kind of things. So I, I just think that uh, it's something that one has to look at carefully. Uh, we need to make sure that we have that balance. Most of the times we get into this compliance regimen, and I know Ron can comment on this at length. Uh, we went into the, all the uh, FISMA, which is all certification based on compliance, and forgot what really what it's all about, which is continuous monitoring and, and a proactive security posture. So I know Bob and other CIO, like, you know, when I was a federal CIO, we had to deal with that. We have the same sort of an issue. Uh, so, uh, but on the other hand, as you mentioned, when the disaster happens, you know, you're out of service. When 9-11 happened, uh, uh, we had to go, and I was in the FBI headquarters. It was uh, SATCOM and text, because all the rest of it was gone. We had national security emergency preparedness, NSCV priority, gets cards, remember all of that? Nothing worked. The, the phone network crashed. You just couldn't use anything. So I'm just saying I think those are challenges that uh, we got to consider. And I think uh, I'd love to talk more about that. But in this forum, I think maybe we can just leave it at that. Uh, in our environment, it's, I, I need to clarify one of my earlier statements. I kind of left you with the impression we have a full-blown BYOD program at the house. It's an unofficial BYOD program, so it's not, it's not actually authorized. They've just been kind of doing that on the side. And so what I've been doing is, is trying to get my arms around that by making an official BYOD program, having rules and policies and guidelines to kind of address some of the risks you're talking about. And I think um, Kevin had mentioned earlier about things like they're not supporting various uh, levels of Android. And that those types of things. There, without having an official policy at the house, there's so many risks by not kind of getting your arms around that. And so it would be things like that, like with Android, I think it's at um, 
version three where they offer full encryption, anything less than that, you're not going to get full encryption, which would be something we would want. But right now, I mean, the house is um, sort of a Burger King model. It's like, you can have it your way. We'll, we'll move heaven and earth <laughs> to make sure you get it your way. And I don't think that that's necessarily the safest way to go about that. But we're uh, in, in define mode with sort of coming up with what we think the, the lanes in the road are. Thank you. Did you have a follow-up on that? Okay. The one thing I wanted to just double check on. So when we talk about application stores for mobile devices, um, typically we're talking about leveraging, if, particularly if it's iOS or it's, it's um, Android, you're talking about the, the Apple iTunes store or whatever it's called and Google Market or whatever it's called. But if you look at the reference architecture that came out last week, uh, it very much talks about the uh, government agencies, departments having their own internal store that would be used for things like, um, you know, uh, domain-specific applications that you might be using, Kevin, or for, you know, domain-specific for government workers within the state of Hawaii, or for your congressmen versus their aides or attaches, which shouldn't have access to certain things. So I guess my question for you is, are you beginning to look at building your own stores internal? And the, the second question I have is, on your question earlier of using Citrix, you know, step back from that as a general functional thing of having a virtualized desktop. Does that aid in both your, your uh, handling of the lifecycle management of your applications as well as improving your mobile device management? Go ahead, I'll go. Um, Looking at the, the, the application stores, we absolutely do want to have um, control of our segment of some type of application store, not necessarily having being a Coast Guard one. Um, right now we're working with DOD, but I would uh, hope that depending on how your, arc, your networks are architected, we're .mil, it would be a great thing for us to have a segment of DOD, which would pro probably be at DISA, where the Coast Guard would be able to have their application store. Um, which would be the, the goal that we would have. All the applications within the Coast Guard certainly aren't applicable to, to folks throughout uh, the Department of Defense, probably even some of the DHS ones but could potentially uh, be there, or the Coast Guard would have a, a look into that. I would be all for and, and support the idea of working together on these things rather than trying to go out and develop independent ones because the, the independence, uh, it just promotes proprietary solutions which uh, are dangerous and we found that have, have actually burned us in, in the long run and uh, getting too close to one solution all the time isn't necessarily the most open architecture we want to be able to keep uh, resilient and be able to work within uh, open standard type capabilities. So Play Store, iStore, those types of things, um, those applications can actually be provided. There's some solutions out there where uh, for example, Good Dynamics, you can run a, any application that's on there through a process called Vericode, where they'll actually look at the application and be able to provide it on the iStore, and then it will actually run within the Good Dynamics uh, secure container, which is kind of a neat concept. But those, that's certainly not the only concept out there, so we don't want this to be a commercial, it's just what, what the Coast Guard is doing right now. Uh, is in, in respective to things like uh, Citrix, Citrix and things, uh, we really like that. We're, we're seeing a lot of folks coming in in the medical community doing that because it's a great solution if you're in the office and you have Wi-Fi connected. However, for a solution, for example, we're trying to put iPads uh, in the hands of our pilots. Uh, normally, they have to take a very large case of books and publications when they go flying. When we're looking at the electronic flight bag, we're prototyping it right now and that capability puts everything on the iPad, but we have a problem with data at rest and data in transit. They're not connected all the time. They need to be able to store their information and be able to have the device uh, keep the information protected while the device is in a sleep mode or sleep state. So those types of things uh, limit the, some of the capabilities, whereas if you're in the, the medical offices or you're well-connected environment where you're not storing sensitive data on the, on the device is actually a great solution but again, we got to look at the use cases and seeing how we can find the best of all the different technologies to make sure we're meeting user needs. Yeah, I would just add that uh, I think sometimes we look at the problem the wrong way. Uh, we have grown up in this area where we think of moats and walls and, and perimeter defense and network and defense in depth and all those sort of things, and that's fine. But we forgot what really it's all about. It's about the data. 
and information. <laughs> Some of the information should be open and we don't need to protect it. Please take it and, and you should have it by default. And it's the sensitive data which is at rest and in motion is really what you got to protect because data within a context becomes that information and then it goes different places and that's what we cannot track. So we're solving in the most cases the wrong problem. We're solving all this network defense and other things and device-based uh, security when really what people are after, you know, if you, what are they really after? They're after information. And so I think that's really a challenge. But meanwhile, I think the CIO Council, when I was the federal CIO Council, and I think Bob, you may be actually now, uh, uh, you know, more familiar with this, but I used to chair the Architecture and Infrastructure Committee, uh, and in there, we have, they have promulgated a standard, which is the baseline configuration for uh, uh, desktops and laptops. Well, why can't they create one for mobile devices, for example, that is the authorized way to go forward? Another program in the DoD used to be Forge, Forge.mil. Why can't we have a source Forge that is basically a software repository where you can check things and check out based on a certain classification level at SBU, for example. SBU pretty much covers most of the other stuff that you can have, for example, on your Nippernet and others. So that is another area that we could look at. Also, I think it's culture. At the end of the day, people want something quick and they want it hassle-free and most of the other people are risk averse, back to the HR discussion. Why would someone take the, stick their neck out? So let me understand this. Yeah, I'm the guy who allowed you to access the data and compromise the whole security of the government. Yeah, right, right. I'm gonna let you bring your BYOD. Sure, yeah, yeah. Uh, have you heard of a technology called CYO or CYA? See, CYA is cover your, in Hawaii we call it CYA, it's cover your okoles. And that's what we are. So I think the quality is the backside, by the way. Uh, so I just think that's the challenge we have. It's cultural. There is no incentive for anyone to do this. And that has to change. Until that changes, and we change that data culture, we're still really talking about perimeter defenses, folks. We're really not talking about the data security. And I think that is an area where I'm sure all of you have some solutions that we should look at. Thank you. Uh, from an App Store perspective, the Congress, um, they're, they're not going to be in the business of either whitelisting or blacklisting apps. They're completely into open and full access to, to whatever, whatever staff want or need to do their jobs. Because they do, and that seems sort of like, okay, there should be things that should be blocked. But they research all sorts of interesting legislation that would kind of pop them onto websites that uh, maybe would be blocked, you know, in, in, a, uh, in uh, the executive branch. Uh, so that aside, there are a lot of efforts right now within the Congress to become more transparent. So we have an open Congress initiative in the, within the clerk's office. Um, so that's going to make everything searchable. It puts all of our, um, every single disbursement we do at Congress, I'm literally a line item in their, in their monthly disbursement statements. And so it'll have my salary if I bought a pencil, like everything. It's all very, very transparent. And so up to this point, I mean, they've been required by law to do that for many, many years. But it was in this bulky format that wasn't searchable. So we're actually putting in a format that you can actually search and sort it and come up with all sorts of interesting analysis that way. So we are moving more into transparency. Another thing that we're doing in Congress um, is uh, Law Revision Council are the folks who are in charge of compiling all the code. And, um, up, they, they were years and years behind because every single time that there's a, a, a comma or anything, a clause added to every part of the U.S. code, they have to recompile it and they were so far behind. But at this point, they're actually making that, there's a huge initiative to make that searchable online and, and to make those in a mobile app types of formats to make it more accessible to the average citizen and to make the um, information sortable and more meaningful. Um, another thing that we're doing is um, web streaming of every single hearing that we have. And uh, despite the fact that you would think that most things are on C-SPAN, you're not going to see subcommittee hearings. You're not going to see certain, unless it's sort of big and splashy and that sort of thing. Generally, they're not all televised. But now, as a, as a general rule, they're all um, done through webcasting. And so there's a move afoot. Right now, they're you know, available via in, um, you know, internet, but to make sort of apps to make that a lot more um, accessible to, to the average citizen. Yeah, Teresa, if I could just add one thing you brought up, a very, very interesting point about open data. Uh, the data.gov initiative that we did with the White House was an incredible uh, opening, but it's not now a U.S. event or a U.S. government event. It's a world thing. It's, a, it's even beyond world in the sense of it is about citizens and the government, what they, what what they want to see. The challenge that we have, again, is the fact that, again, we've got to look at that data. 
but also data, when it links stuff together, can have a mosaic effect where you can start getting information that may have some security challenges. So it's very interesting. I think the new mobile API strategy from the White House is a very good one that uh, Steve Van Rokel has come out with, which builds upon Vivek's work. I think those are all interesting things. Again, we'd love to get some ideas as to how you see this balance. I would say to you that we need a neighborhood watch program, literally, a very simple put. If we all work and help each other out, we can put more data out there as we help each other and say, oh, wait a second, there's a hole over here or something like that. Unfortunately, people, if you don't know what's going on, then we think we're secure, actually, but someone is just stealing all the stuff from the back door, yeah? So that's the challenge. Right. And the back door could include your partners. Yes. Right. That's the real issue. Question problem. in the middle. Yes, going back to uh, BYOD, I've not seen the benefit of BYOD. In our, in our user community, they don't see the benefit of it, and neither do we see it on the business side. And uh, you know, from a congressional standpoint, yeah, they work for us, or at least allegedly they work for us, so it makes sense maybe that they bring their own device, but, but I don't see any benefit and it just seems like this is being touted from, from various sources. But when we, you know, polled our user community, nobody wanted to do it. It's, it was an expense to them as they saw it. And from a business perspective, it was a risk to us. So can anyone speak on the benefit of BY? So hold on, before you do, you got to remember that the, the federal government and the government as an industry as a whole is just a subset of, of the, the, the industries that are targeted by technology or changed by technology. If I'm in the retail space and I'm at Guess or something like that, um, and I've got a steady flow of floor um, assistants, associates, or whatever the salespeople are in Guess or some other store. I don't want to buy and provision phones for each of these people. I want to be able to just have them use their own phone. I don't have the level of sophistication and security of information that, that Keith has. So you got to remember there's this whole overall set of industries that are pushing BYOD. The other thing is Blackberries, right? There was this whole age where all of you were using Blackberries or Windows 6. Uh, and um, you know, at that point when you started seeing the iPhone and the, the Android, your, your, your customers were demanding it. Now it's like, okay, you get an iPhone from, from Teresa or Kevin or whomever, I guess you, you don't, they bring their own, right? It's kind of in and out, you don't want to do that. So there are benefits in the rest of the industries. Remember, I, I manage people that cover all these industries, they talk my head off about them. So just wanted to say that first. I'd say that the benefit that my staff and other folks within the state tell me is it's convenience, one device. Some of us like to be the double holster, you know, the old Blackberry and the other one. And you can't connect this to that, you can't do the .gov to the .com, and you can't do the file to this, right? So because some of these files are sensitive, the moment you send it to a .com to your personal address, you've essentially given an e-discovery path that could potentially, you know, you, we can go down that path, right? So it's a, I think, the challenge is, on the benefit side, it's really the convenience. Uh, and, and you can work with one phone, they're familiar with it, they got all this stuff on there, it's there. Uh, of course, uh, the other thing is, is, at some point, is cost and maintenance potentially could be cheaper if we can look at it that way. Our challenge is because most of the environments and organizations don't have their act together, so, and because they're risk averse, because they're not gonna be caught with that CYA technology that I was talking about, you would, obviously say, hey, wait a second, uh, I'd rather have this device is yours and this device is mine, I'm responsible for this one, that one is your responsibility. And it makes it really clean on the demarcation. So those are the choices here. So. Teresa? Um, I'm not, to be honest with you, I'm not fully convinced that there are a lot of benefits to BYODI. But then again, I'm, I'm an inspector general, so I'm very much about focused on risks. Um, the, the, one of the things, yeah, and, and one of the services I provide to the Congress is I provide nonpartisan um, advice. And so with that, I'll do a lot of analysis on emerging trends and technologies, whether it's BYOD or whether it was when they were getting ready to implement an internal house cloud, looking at encryption solutions for that. So we do a lot of internal proactive risk uh, guidance. And so in, in with the BYOD um, topic, a lot of the analysis that we did got into, um, one of the arguments you always hear is cost transference to um, you know, the employee. 
But honestly, when you look at that, so the employees can be buying their own devices, so therefore the, the organization no longer has to incur that cost. But when you look at it globally, you're going to be losing the buying power of you know, having government, the, the, the weight of the government behind you and getting the best data plan or, or getting uh, the, be the best deal for the government. You get into all these risks of who, who actually owns the data. Can I remotely wipe that data if you own the device? And I, I uh, personally, it's, I've advised them against doing it. Now, there's unique instances at the house that we're forced to kind of live in sort of a quasi BYOD environment because of the election laws where they can't have, they can't have campaign information on a government provided device. They all have government provided devices, but they can't commingle. And so therefore, we're kind of stuck in this hybrid world. It's not ideal, but it is what it is because of election laws. And I understand those election laws. Um, but if I were in your shoes, I don't know that I'd be signing up so quickly. I don't see the benefits of it. I see lots of risks. I think it would have been good to try to find an advocate for it because I'm not one either and, and we aren't. Um, one thing on the, uh, an interesting thought that I've th often thought about it right now is uh, the dual persona or limited use of the device. And the thing is, is I actually think that um, over time, th having the company provide the device for the user is actually um, good for the company because if the company allows or, or the business or the government allows the a little bit of a dual persona use then secretly you're going to have your 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 kids soccer game pop up right next to the appointment that you have or the presentation you have to do tomorrow so you're actually going to answer work emails while you're at the soccer game so you're actually going to get more out of those people <laughs> and it's it's kind of a, a self-serving thing for the company but i actually think that the limited use is something that is good and will actually is, uh, is the one camp and will put BYOD uh, away. And I, I just don't see the benefits of the BYOD. The, the one last thing I ju just on BYOD, and, and we see this in every industry, in, including government, there are always a set of your employees that do not need access to very critical information. They don't need access to very sensitive domain-specific applications associated with that information. And in that case, it's very easy to see the cost benefit and to define the program and look at all the risks per the new guidelines that came out last week in a way that you could uh, facilitate doing BYOD. But for most of your, your valued information workers, whatever they may be, whether they're flying a plane or they're the, the, the key congressional aide, those folks, it's a different story. Um, we've got time for just about one more question. So does anyone have any other questions? One last question. Anyone? Okay. Oh, one, one question. <laughs> you just gave away the mic. <laughs> so um, I think my perspective uh, is that BYOD is here whether we want it or not. Um, and so I think uh, a lot of what you talked about was the access perspective. Right? What do we what do we allow um, those that are bringing devices into the workplace? What access do we do we allow? Do we register those devices? Do we load MDM software? What apps do they have access to? I think if we just say we're not doing it, we're going to be at more of a risk than if we actually try to address it. Uh, and so that's my perspective, and and I think you know I see most of my customers and staff walking around with iPads that I didn't give them and and they're doing a lot of things and and so what I'm what, what I'm looking at now is just what access do they have and what can I limit in terms of the risk because it's just gonna get worse and in terms of the benefits ultimately down the road that device that they bring to work is their device I don't have to buy and purchase and maintain potentially down the road other devices so. No, I, I, it's a great point. So I, again, let me just be very clear what I'm saying. At this point in time, that now that we've inherited an enterprise, the enterprise current policy by default is this. However, we do allow uh, uh, from, a, uh, you know, from a mobile web perspective, you can get to certain apps and stuff like that. We do allow that. Obviously, we do encourage the, the web as a way to register and stuff like that. But I think the point that you're trying to drive at is a good one in that we do have to have an official policy because, again, I believe in the law of entropy. Nature abhors a vacuum and nature finds a way. 
people will bring their devices, and if you don't know about it, something's going to happen. You may as well know about it up front and set up an area where through a repository or through a mobile registry or through a, a way you can deal with the government. Uh, the White House has come up with this new policy called mygov.gov, which is your government, your way, customized through your portal, right? We're also doing something called myhawaii.gov, which is going to be a secure, multi-factor authenticated way that you can go in. So we do allow that, and there'll be some sanctioned apps and so on and so forth. I think that's one way to do it. And you're right, we need to investigate how to bring some of the information in, but limit it. But they will not have access, repeat, not have access to some of the sensitive stores until we have a better solution. So I think you're right, there has to be some compromise that is going to be worked out. So a good point, yeah, absolutely. I would just say that it's all about the user agreement. And when folks start bumping up into that, uh, what you're suggesting with the BYOD, if the users have signed the user agreement, then they're not going to get upset when their device is being remotely wiped of the information, because that's, the, that's what we're looking at. And uh, throughout government, we see classified spills all the time, unfortunately. And it's not because, it's usually not because of machines. It's usually because of people. And they're, where they're taking uh, something they read in an email and putting it into another email. Uh, I was just hearing on the news today that uh, at least on government systems within the Coast Guard, all that is subject to monitoring. So what about all the other things that are happening on that personal device? Are they subject to monitoring now? So those types of things, the user agreement. So I would say, so within my own office, which is where the only place I have total control, um, would be uh, all my staff have iPads and, and iPhones. And so one of the things when we deployed those, um, we put out a very detailed policy as to their lanes in the road, what they can and can't do. And so, for example, you'd have to, Think about um, you know data leaks. How how are all the different ways would there be data leaks? And so they're required to have obviously a pin on there with a certain level of complexity. They're required. Um, the one thing they're absolutely not allowed to do is to store anything uh, via iCloud. Um, so there's certain things that we've spelled out. I mean, even Siri. I don't want them using Siri on their handheld uh, or on their iPhone because. As we've heard now, I suspected it, because I actually put the policy in before they actually disclosed the fact that Siri has a database, and they're capturing all the, what people are saying and this sort of thing. I don't want it. If you're dictating an email, you better not <laughs> use your fingers. Don't dictate through Siri to dictate an email that's an official email. So there, it's those types of policies. You just kind of think about what your security vulnerabilities are and make sure that you have really good policies in place and that people understand them. Because there's, there's varying levels of technical capabilities with all my staff. So my finan I have one financial statement auditor. Uh, it, she's, she's just not a techie person. And so you, but you have to sit down and kind of go through th with that person. This is what iCloud is. Don't do this. You're going to get yourself in trouble. So make sure you communicate it well and that people you know, are, are positioned for success if we're complying with those policies. So don't ask Siri what's the best way to hide a scandal? No. no? OK. <laughs> well, we've run out of time. I really want to thank the panelists. Uh, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much. And uh, at that point, uh, we have a networking um, break now for the next 15 minutes. Thank you.